Hello, I am John Shahan, and like you, I am wild about Washington. In Washington, the fishing never stops. This month, Will Morrison has some tips on Columbia River sturgeon fishing. The young ones and the old ones are protected, but if you catch a legal fish, it's yours for dinner. Or you can release it and just take home the experience. Well, welcome to the Main Stem Columbia River Sturgeon Fishing. Uh, one of the things you might want to do is get yourself a sturgeon pole, a pretty hardy sticks. Uh, we're using what's called an ugly stick here, and it's a 30 pound test and a fairly big reel. We're using squid for bait today. Sturgeon fishing is a popular sport for Columbia River fishermen. We generally do it during the summer months, but it can be done year round. On sturgeon fishing for the main stem Columbia River, it's a minimum of 42 inches and a maximum of 60 inches. And generally one fish per day and an actual annual limit of five fish per year. The really fun part about sturgeon fishing is you can catch multiple fish and you don't really know what you're going to get. You could possibly get one from about two feet up to about eight to ten feet long, so you never know what you're going to get. And there's almost always constant action. When fishing in the main stem Columbia, we always recommend that you wear a life preserver and always be aware of your surroundings. There are major tugs and barges going up and down the Columbia River and uh, you should not anchor up in the main channel. Be sure to check the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife pamphlet for current seasons for openings and closures for the, the main stem Columbia. Columbia River smelt, we use it also for sturgeon bait. Fish comes up and bites it by the head. There are other fisheries going on at this time. Some of those fisheries include fishing for steelhead and salmon near the mouths of some of the tributaries the Lewis River, the Callis River, the Washougal River. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has a great website that you might want to check for excellent information on fishing the main stem Columbia. If catching a fish up to five feet long intrigues you, coming down here when the season reopens on October 1st would be a great place to go. Here are other fishing opportunities in the coming weeks.
To get ready for fall salmon season, Steve Teesfield demonstrates the proper release of wild salmon, first in real time, then in slow motion. This is important if we want to keep salmon fishing for the next generation. Wild About Washington's producer recently spent a day with 4th through 6th graders at the Hood Canal Salmon Enhancement Group's Salmon Day Camp. He learned two things that day. First, if salmon are to survive, our children need to understand the science of fish habitat. The second thing he learned, to be a parent, it's best if you're young and full of energy. The salmon camp itself is to give the kids a very holistic perspective of wild salmon and wild salmon ecosystems. And um, so they have an understanding of how the terrestrial world is connected to the aquatic world. We want them to um, understand the relationship with food webs. We want them to understand the, um, the ecology behind it, the biology behind it. So we try to give them a lot of hands-on experiences that help to build those, um, those, that concrete foundation for them. And so they're able to come away with a, um, a broad understanding of um, wild salmon ecosystems and um, the importance of all the biotic and abiotic um, components that are associated with that. I like learning things, that's basically the whole thing, and I like coming here because it's fun. And you get to do a lot of things where you get to go on trips and stuff. An important thing that I'm learning about is salmon and trees and different types of plants and bugs and what things eat in the ocean. Well, I like learning about salmon and I like exploring. Gosh, we're doing um, benthic macroinvertebrates in the streams. We're going out and we're checking out the estuaries and we're checking out things that are um, the forge fish that live in the eelgrass. And so they're kind of seeing critters um, on a little bit different level than what they would probably see just walking through the streams or um, walking out in the near shore. But we do think that this ties in really well with school and it um, ties in with the eelers that uh, Washington State Standards has. And so. Um, it just builds on those uh, concrete or those foundations that they're already learning in school, but they're actually able to do hands-on applied science out here in the field, which they don't often get that opportunity in the classroom. Yeah, it's just really fun because you get to go on a lot of vacations, like around the forest and stuff, and you get to go around in a lot of nature and learn about it. Like the life cycle of like plants and bugs and salmon. I've been here for three years and then I became a counselor for the day camp. I like to like help the ch kids and it's really fun because you get to, it, they're funny and they're fun to be around and how much they know about salmon and all of the things that they've learned. It's really cool. We think it's a great camp when we know that the kids have come away with um, a really good experience and that they want to come back for more but if they also have a real appreciation of nature in general and of our, of our wild salmon, because that's what this is really all about, for them to understand this keystone species and how it's very important to the Pacific Northwest and to our own watershed and for them to have a really good um, understanding of their watershed address. And so um, if they come away with a great experience and want to come back, then we know we're doing our job. A couple of months ago, we answered the question of why concerning bird watching. This month, biologist and bird watcher extraordinaire Bill Twite gives us a basic lesson in the how. The first thing that you need when you think about starting bird watching is a good set of tools. And everybody thinks about binoculars when they think about bird watchers, and that's for a really good reason. When you look at a bird through binoculars, you're looking at it anywhere from seven to ten times as close as you should be approaching it. It's a way of bringing the bird out of its environment right up to you instead of you having to chase after the bird in order to get a good look. Binoculars nowadays are far better than what they were even 20 years ago. So my advice is don't start off with that old pair that's been laying around in your house for 30 years. 
it'll, it'll only disappoint you and you'll end up being frustrated as a bird watcher. Instead, invest some money. You don't have to invest a lot, but invest some money, maybe a couple hundred dollars, in a reasonably good pair. So let me talk a little bit about what makes a good pair of binoculars. First off, there's two basic types. Not just old and new, but actual different types. The roof prism binoculars that most people prefer are, are cylinders, sort of straight through type cylinders, versus the older types that are still fairly commonly available and are good, but the poro prism that actually, where the light gets bent and turned, and you can recognize poro prism always because the objective lenses are, the lenses are lined up differently instead of in a tube. These don't transmit light as well, and they're much more susceptible to breakage when you drop them. Pay attention to the numbers on the binoculars. For instance, this old pair are 8 by 30, which means they're 8 power, but have only 30 millimeter lens here. And they don't let in a lot of light for that 8 power, and so again, you'll be frustrated. The birds will appear dark. This pair are 10 by 42, meaning 10 power, but also 42, a bigger lens. They let in a lot more light. So you want something that's at least a magnification of 7 and probably not more than 10 because you can't hold it steady and smaller than 7 it's kind of why, why bother. And you want an objective lens that's hopefully a ratio of 4 or 5 to the power. So if it's 7 it should be 35. If it's 10 it should be 40 or 50, somewhere in there. That'll give you enough light to work with. The other thing that you'll need, and fortunately this will cost you a lot less than the binoculars, is at least one good bird guide. And, and you've got several choices now on the market. Um, again, this is, uh, there's been a real profusion of really good bird guides in the last few years, giving you a lot of different choices. One alternative is just go local. And this is a very good alternative, particularly if you are going to be doing most of your bird watching locally. Bird watching can and should be a really simple kind of activity, just something you can enjoy in your backyard or something you can enjoy as part of a family vacation. A few simple tools will get you there and add a whole dimension of birds to your life that you may not have appreciated or may only have barely appreciated was there, and it'll open that up wide. You can get a lot more involved in it, but these tools will allow you just to enjoy it as part of a broad suite of enjoying the outdoors and bringing the outdoors to you. Here are some places to see Washington's wildlife in the coming weeks. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching and please join us again. <music>